This video is sponsored by Onshape. This is Max Park, and he is about to break the world record for the fastest Rubik's Cube solve at 3.13 seconds. Yes! And for reference, it takes me about 90 seconds to solve a Rubik's Cube. Now, if you think Max is fast, take a look at what two MIT students built in 2018. At 0.38 seconds, this is the fastest Rubik's Cube solve ever. And it seems borderline impossible. After watching that video, I wanted to build my own, but the motors that they used are pretty expensive. Luckily, I have a bunch of brushless motors lying around. Most commonly used on drones, brushless motors, among many things, are fast. Really fast. So just how fast could we solve a Rubik's Cube if we used six of these? Let's build a Rubik's Cube solving robot with drone motors. There are basically going to be three components that go into making this machine. Camera vision that will figure out what the cube looks like, a powerful algorithm that is going to figure out the best way to solve the cube, and motor control, which will translate the algorithm's solution into physical moves to perform on the cube. But before I figure out any of that, I need to figure out what kind of cube I should use, because as it turns out, it does make a difference. So Ben Kotz, the guy who built the world record Rubik's Cube Solver, has a lot of information about how he built his machine on his blog. One of the big things that I learned from reading his blog posts is that you actually don't want to use a really expensive cube. Expensive cubes have low friction, are more flexible, and have magnets to snap in place. Now for SpeedCuber, this is really good because SpeedCubers use their hands to manipulate the cube, and the more flexible the cube is, the easier it is to manipulate, which means faster solve times. On the other hand, with really fast Rubik's Cube solving machines, a flexible cube is actually counterproductive. The solution to this is to just use a really cheap cube, like this one that I bought on Amazon for five bucks. With this cube, you can also pop off the center pieces to further tension it. This also makes a great place to connect the motor shaft. I'm starting off the build with this one axis test setup, just so I can see how fast we can get this thing to go. And it goes pretty darn fast. Right now, it's doing eight different turns in about 400 milliseconds. I had to actually slow down the footage further to see what was going on. Part of the reason that I'm able to turn the brushless motor so fast, yet precise, is because I'm controlling it with an FOC controller. FOC stands for Field Oriented Control, and to put it simply, it allows you to turn your high-speed brushless motor into a very precise servo motor. These boards use closed-loop control, and generally, you can control position, velocity, or torque. The specific board that I'm using is an O-Drive S1, and I used 12 of these on my robot dog project, and they worked great. These boards also have encoders on the back, so if we just attach an encoder magnet to the back of our brushless motor, then we can let the O-Drive do its thing in software, which allows us to control position, velocity, or torque. This controller also has awesome braking capabilities. During the braking process, the O-Drive acts like an electrical generator and dumps energy into a 2-ohm brake resistor in order to get the motor to stop immediately. You definitely can't pull this off with a regular drone ESC. Currently, I am running the motor at 30 volts, which is the highest my power supply will go up to, but I think I need to up the power. And the only thing better than 30 volts is 48 volts, which is the highest I can go up to with these boards, otherwise I would have gone higher. Upping the voltage definitely got it to turn faster. This is what one turn looks like. This is what two turns look like. And now it does eight turns in 290 milliseconds rather than 400. At this point, I've done all the one axis testing that I want to do. So now it's time to design and build the full solver. After spending some time on the design, I came up with this, which I made in a software called Onshape, today's sponsor. Onshape is the best cloud native and PDM solution on the market. I recently started using Onshape and it has honestly been great. Having my designs saved to the cloud means that I don't have to worry about losing my work every time my computer crashes, which is a lot. The best part about Onshape is that it's collaborative. Multiple people can work on the same design and you can see the updates in real time. So if you're looking to streamline your team's workflow or just need CAD software for yourself, Onshape is the way to go. Onshape is free and you can sign up today using the link in my description. All right, now back to the video. With the design done, it's time to print the parts. I'm printing everything on my Creality CP01 in PLA. I need the parts to be strong, so I'm printing at 20% infill. And with all of the parts printed, it's time to assemble everything.
Now this machine has six axes, one for each face of the cube. Previously, during one axis testing, the motor shaft design looked like this. I've since redesigned it to look like this. Not only because it looks much better, but because a thinner design is going to allow the cameras to see the entire face of the cube. And speaking of cameras, I'm going to be using two pixie cams to figure out what the cube looks like at any given moment. You'll notice that each camera can view three faces of the cube when positioned very strategically. One camera is positioned high and the other is positioned low. And so between the two cameras, we should be able to view all six faces. I definitely had to do some tinkering in CAD to make sure I got the camera alignment to be just right. Like other parts of this project, I got the idea to position the cameras like this from Ben Kotz's blog. The brain of the machine is a Teensy 4.1 microcontroller, and I'm programming it on the Arduino IDE. The Teensy has eight serial communication ports, which is perfect because I have six motors and two cameras. So now that everything is pretty much built, the next step is to move on to software. I first want to run some tests, and then I want to program an algorithm to be able to solve the queue itself, and then I want to use the cameras to tell me what the cube looks like. And after that, we should have our final solver. The goal of motor testing is to start the tuning process by figuring out what motor settings work best before coding the actual solving algorithm. Because unfortunately, this isn't as simple as shooting the motor from one position to another as fast as possible. The O-Drive boards have a bunch of settings that determine how reactive the motors are. I like to think of the motors as virtual springs that you can dampen or stiffen to your liking using the controller. I started motor testing with one axis testing, then two axis testing, then three axis testing. After a couple of jams, I found out that the motor shafts were pretty weak because a couple of them broke. Printing the shafts at 20% infill made them too hollow to handle the forces due to jamming. I decided to print new ones at 100% infill, which doubled the mass and therefore doubled the density. And yes, I have to completely take apart the machine when a shaft breaks or when I need to take out the cube. Could I have designed this better? Definitely. Will I redesign it? Definitely not. Currently, I'm running into a couple of issues with the cube itself, and sometimes when the motors get into a jam, the cube becomes really loose, and I think that's because some of the screws are becoming loosened. One way I tried to fix this was to make a sort of industrial grade Rubik's cube with super glue, and that didn't really turn out well, so the next thing I tried was to switch out the screws. The cube comes with these counter sunk screws, so I'm switching those out for counter bore screws that are slightly longer and have a slightly bigger thread size. I also added a washer because I noticed that there was some rubbing between the screw and the centerpiece. Not so fast, Buster. Although I thought the screws were the problem, turns out the cheap cube gets loosened when it turns at high speeds. Who would have thought? In other words, changing the screws did absolutely nothing. I ended up printing these spacers to fit in the centers of the cube to keep it nice and tight. As for the jamming issue, well, that pretty much kept on happening. After some more tuning, here is six axis testing. Once again, it's not solving anything, it's just simulating what a solve would look like. Now it's time to work on what is probably the most vital part of this build, which is the algorithm that's going to solve the Rubik's Cube. There are over 43 quintillion ways in which a Rubik's Cube can be scrambled, which to me just sounds completely unreal. I guess one way to go about this would be to solve all 43 quintillion scrambles, but that would probably take a bit of time. Now this is the part of the video where I'm supposed to tell you about the genius level algorithm that I came up with to solve a Rubik's Cube, but that simply just did not happen. Instead, I turned to GitHub to find a Cosiemba algorithm that I could use. Cosiemba is a widely used algorithm for Rubik's Cube solving robots. Now, I won't pretend to understand how this algorithm works. There's a lot of math involved in it and lots of research that has gone into it to make it as optimal as it is now. What I will say is that this algorithm hinges upon something called God's number, which is 20. What God's number basically means is that any of those 43 quintillion Rubik's Cube scrambles can be solved in 20 moves or less. Considering that some of the best speed cubers in the world average between 45 to 50 moves per solve, God's number being 20 is honestly quite remarkable. What's even crazier about God's number is that it took 30 years to prove that it was actually 20. So the next time that you solve a Rubik's Cube, don't feel accomplished because there's pretty much a guaranteed possibility that you could have solved it much, much faster. And now that we have an algorithm to solve the cube, all we need is a way to use the cameras to tell us what the cube looks like. In order to figure out how to do this, we first need to understand what a Rubik's Cube is. If you've ever watched a tutorial on how to solve a Rubik's Cube, then you've probably gotten this lecture, but here's the short version. 
A Rubik's Cube has six sides, which we call faces. On each face, there are nine tiles, which we call facets, which means that there are 54 facets on a Rubik's Cube in total. Now, something that may not immediately be apparent is that the facets on the center of each face don't move, no matter how you scramble the cube. What this means is that four things will always be true when you pick up a Rubik's Cube scrambled in any way. One, the side with the white center will always be opposite to the side with the yellow center. Two, the side with the red center will always be opposite to the side with the orange center. Three, the side with the blue center will always be opposite to the side with the green center. And four, if you were to hold the cube with the white center in front and the red center on top, the green center has to be on the right side. Because these four things are always true, we can develop a Rubik's Cube notation. In code, we can essentially identify a specific base set by determining what side it's on, and what side it's on is determined by the color of that side center. Now, the way that we'll determine the color of each face set is actually pretty simple. These cameras can read the RGB values of a pixel. RGB is a color model that defines every color as a mixture of red, green, and blue. Let's say we have a certain color called color X, which has RGB values RX, GX, and BX. Let's also say that the camera detects a certain pixel on one of the face sets called pixel Y, with RGB values RY, GY, and BY. We can define a value called error as the sum of the differences between the R, G, and B values of color X and pixel Y. If the error is low, then the pixel closely resembles the color. If the error is high, then the pixel doesn't resemble the color. If we then have multiple colors, we can find the error between each of them and the pixel and conclude that the color with the lowest error is the same color as the pixel. If we do this for a single pixel on each facet, then we can determine the color of every facet, and therefore determine what the cube looks like. Unfortunately, this method doesn't always work perfectly. One of the challenges that I faced was determining the difference between red and orange, because they're so close on the RGB scale. This was also a problem that Ben Kotz faced, and he fixed it by using Sharpie on one of the colors. I tried doing the same, but for some reason that I still can't explain, the camera sees black and white as the same. I ended up having to use an X-Acto knife to scratch off the Sharpie. I eventually did find a way to differentiate red and orange. Now red and orange both have essentially the same concentration of red, but red has a higher concentration of blue than green, and orange has a higher concentration of green than blue. Now another problem that I had with camera vision didn't have to do with reading the colors, but had to do with visibility. The shaft on each axis hides a face set and so it's hard to get a reliable reading on the color of that face set from just the one pixel. Now, I guess one way to fix this would be to get multiple readings of different pixels, but I found an even better way to find the color of that face set. All of the hidden face sets are part of corner pieces, or pieces composed of three face sets. Corner pieces are interesting because they're unique enough that you only need to know the color and position of two of its face sets to determine the color of the third. For example, this corner piece has a green face set on the left and a white face set on the right, so the face set on top has to be orange. Now this corner piece also has green and white face sets, but white is on the left this time and green is on the right, so red has to be on top. Programming this just involved writing the rules of the eight corner pieces. Once again, there are 54 face sets on the cube, but now the camera only has to find the color of 48 of them, since six of them are hidden by the shafts. The color of these six hidden face sets will then be determined based on the color of the two other adjacent face sets that make up that corner. Another challenge of determining color was lighting. Lighting determines your baseline. So in one lighting setting, orange can be read as a certain RGB value. And in another lighting setting, orange can be read as another RGB value. Luckily, these cameras have saturation and brightness settings. So I did a lot of tuning of those to fix the lighting issue. And after lots and lots and lots of tuning, I finally got my first solve. Now a solve under two seconds is cute, but I think we can go faster, a lot faster. Alright, so let's talk numbers. 
I ran 20 different trials and I collected three pieces of data for each trial. The first thing that I collected was the time it takes the TNT to scan the cube and come up with a solution using the algorithm. The second thing that I recorded was the number of moves that the algorithm generates. And the third thing that I collected was the time it actually takes to solve the cube physically. So overall, on average, the inspection time is 0.7 seconds. On average, it takes about 21 moves to solve a cube. And on average, it takes about 1.3 seconds to actually carry out those moves physically. The fastest solve that I got was about one second and the slowest solve that I got was about 1.4 seconds. So it turns out you can solve a Rubik's Cube with drone motors and pretty fast too. Now I'm definitely gonna revisit this project sometime in the future. I have a lot of ideas on how to optimize the design and make it a lot faster. The hardest part of making this project was definitely tuning. You'll notice that during the actual solves, I couldn't get the motors to spin as fast as they were when I was doing one axis testing. And the reason for this is because the motors need to coordinate. One move is performed right after another. So if one motor is spinning and doesn't stop exactly where it's supposed to, then when the next motor spins, it's going to jam. And because the cube has to be so tensioned, I can't use corner cutting. Corner cutting is a practice among speed cubers where your flexible cube allows you to not have one face completely turned before you turn the next. Overall, I'm pretty happy with this project. Being able to consistently solve a Rubik's cube in under one and a half seconds is pretty cool. If you are interested in looking at the CAD and code for this project, you can check the links in the description. I will also be posting Ben Kotz's blog post in the description. If you enjoyed watching this video, then you're definitely going to want to read about how he made his solver. That's it for this video, and thanks for watching.